you build your self-confidence, your self-esteem in, in what you do and, and being proud, then you can't ever really take that away. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 584, with today's guest, Mr. Brett Chan. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, the things that we do beyond this show, please check out whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also the easiest way to find our products. Yeah, we make some stuff. And if you find something that we make that you like, use the code PODCAST15, gets you 15% off, and lets us know that, you know, the folks listening are actually throwing some money our way. It helps justify what we do. The show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes every single week and have for years. Why? Well, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to support that work, there are lots of ways you can help it. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. You could tell a friend. You could pick up a book on Amazon. You could leave a review. You, or you could support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $5, you'll get access. Actually, at $2, you get some access. At $5, you get some audio. $10, video. $25, you get book drafts. And there are actually a couple tiers above that. So go ahead, check it out, see all the things that we've got going on, and then come back and check out this episode. Now, today's episode is with an individual who has been tied to some amazing martial arts content and is tied to some pretty incredible stuff that's yet to come. I'm not going to spoil it by name dropping because I always like when I'm listening and I get to hear those things come out in real time. Oh, wow. They're involved with that. They're part of that. That's super cool. And so you're going to get that experience. We talk about people and places and movies and TV, a number of things that we've already talked about in prior episodes. And yet here's an individual who intersects with quite a few of them. Great conversation, good story. And I hope you enjoy it. So here we go with Mr. Brett Chan. Hey, how are you? Hey, Jeremy, how are you? Pretty well, thank you. Excellent. We don't do video. Mm, okay. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more work. <laughs> it's a lot more work to edit video. No worries. Uh, but thank you for your willingness. Okay. <clears throat> Where are Where you calling in from? Um, Budapest. You're, okay. Yeah, I, I remembered Leslie saying something that you were, you were away. You were on the road. Halo. <clears throat> Sorry? I'm doing it. Halo out in Budapest. Oh, okay. Cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. How long are you there? Till July. <laughs> For a while. Yeah, that's that's a bit. How's that feeling? Well, that's okay. I mean, um, it's kind of good to travel again. Mm. I'm used to traveling a lot for my job, so but sure. it's just you know, the last year and a half it just happened because of COVID and stuff. So Oh, is is this the first the first uh on location gig? uh since warrior season two yeah wow so that was like 2019 of uh july yeah yeah june june and july when i came home so um i just yeah i've been home since working on kung fu and snow piercer and stuff yeah are there i don't know how to, how to say are there i guess habits that you fall out of that are important for being on the road like that and being away for so long? No. I mean, my, my wife's happy. <laughs> <laughs> She's happy I'm home. Um, yeah. And after about being home for about three months and she was sick of it. <clears throat> and then uh, five months later, and she was cool with it again. So yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I go away for so long sometimes. We kind of fall out of our own routines, her and mm. I. And then we kind of takes, it takes a little bit to get back in sync. Yeah. Can I ask how long you've been married? 13 years. Okay. And... Um, You've been doing this for, for a while, right? Were you doing this at the beginning of the marriage? Did she oh, know yeah. what she was... I'd already been doing it for a while. Okay, so, so she I, knew I, what I knew she was getting thing. into. Yeah, yeah. You know, any any time, you know, whether it's something like this or a, a military family, I always find that dynamic so interesting because I find well, that... Go she's ahead. also a sick man, so she's her back. She traveled lots. 
The okay. band traveled a lot. Yeah. For a while at least. Until she met me. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Where where's home? Uh Vancouver, Canada. Okay. A lot going up and a lot going on up in Vancouver. We we've had a number of people on. <clears throat> tons. There's tons going on up there. Yeah. It's so busy. Yeah. Seems like a cool spot. I've I've heard it described as as the only place you can experience four seasons in a single day. Yeah, yeah. It, it, well, I mean, if you come a time in like late, late summer, so like like say fall and uh, early spring, yeah, you'll definitely get all four seasons in one day. You don't know what to, you don't know you don't know what to wear. Should I wear this or should I wear that? Oh, it's spring, <laughs> it's raining. Oh crap! It's snowing. Holy crap! It's snowing. But we uh, have, I'm in Vermont. In the, in the northeast of the U.S. And, and, you know, we have that too, but in a very different way. We have the same dilemmas over what to wear, but it's usually because you get all the weather at the same time and it just creates a mess. Like I, I live on a dirt road and, and there are days where I look outside and say, you know what, I'm just, I'm not going to try to leave my house today. It's too muddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're Vancouver and rain and the snow. So, but yeah. Okay. Like it, it's it's a great place to live though. It's beautiful. I've heard, I've, I've, and I want to get there. Should you should try? When, it's a great place country right now. Yeah. <laughs> the world, the world's insane. What's what's the? Uh, I guess what what's going on with with COVID in Hungary? Um, How are they handling? Well, there's a lockdown. Uh, so there is a lockdown from eight p.m. till five a.m. You can't go out. Unless you have a letter from the government, which subsequently uh, I do, <laughs> but well, there's really nothing to do anyway, so it's not like I go out. <clears throat> um, all the restaurants are closed, but you can order delivery, mm -hmm. and uh, the shops are all open during the day until eight, 8 p.m. Until then, everything's fine. Or maybe 7 p.m. Yeah, okay. um, but you know it's okay though. I mean, with my job, I mean, I like we have to test five days a week. Because we have to be, you know, I think nothing happens to this. Sure. Especially my department. Because if my department goes down, <laughs> the whole production will go down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's no social distancing in what you do. No. Yeah. Has it, has it changed the way you do things? I mean, beyond, beyond that, have, are there, when you, when you look at a scene or something, is there, say, you know, maybe we could do it this way and keep a little more distance? No, you can't really, I mean, other than controlling extras, but you can't really do that because you're just changing the whole show. It's like, as long as we're all being socially responsible with our, our COVID practices and in and out of work, um, because we have a production to, to be responsible for and not just ourselves, then that should be the, the leading cause of it. Um, and my department, everyone's pretty good so far. And I, you know, I, I, I'm in my core team alone, like 40 people on a daily basis. We're interacting with each other, like, like fighting and, and, you know, training and something like that. We're like face to face, although we're in masks, but we're definitely like in each other's faces all the time. Yeah. Obviously, I want to ask you some questions about Kung Fu and then the current landscape of martial arts and martial arts, I, I guess, entertainment. But I want to, I want to go back so we can give the listeners some context on how you got to where you are. So I'm assuming there was at some point you started training something somewhere somehow and it grew from there. When I was seven, my father had put me into a Kung Fu and I did that for a little bit. And then he put me into karate, which is what I, I, I followed most of into it. And I got to a certain point where I was just kind of sick of it. Martial arts in general one because my dad was forcing me to go mm -hmm. like forcing me to go. You know, I get grounded. If I, I would get belted if I didn't. Um, so, wow. why was it so important? And then at that point, because uh, he felt that it brings a lot of discipline in one's life. Okay. And he he was an avid martial artist. Ah, okay. And uh, it was important from that point. Um, so you know, I had to do it. I said okay. So you know, I I was doing it seven days a week. So um, even though I was on the track team and I was on the volleyball team and the basketball team, I had to all that at some point and just focus on martial arts seven days a week sometimes i had to travel down to toronto so i was in the saga and you know being like 
14 years old, you know, you had to take after school, 3.30, 4.30, then you jump on a bus, it takes another couple of hours, and you take a subway, and you're downtown, and now you're doing martial arts for two, three hours. And then, you know, you get picked up and come home, it's like 9.30 p.m., so. It's a long day for a kid. Yeah, and, and that was that was pretty consistent. So, um, and then I, I, I strayed away from it for about a year, and then I, I got back into it, but didn't, I took it on my own terms, and I had to start taking all different martial arts, but still maintaining what I was doing, which is karate. And then, um, you know, I got my black one taekwondo and I kept leveling up on my karate and I started taking different, different styles of karate. And I was taking kickboxing and I was doing Muay Thai and I was doing some Arnis and I was doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And so the journey just continues on. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like in the philosophy of Bruce Lee says, it's, it's a hybrid way. Yeah. You kind of take the best of elements that you find which suit your body and your style and you kind of, you know, create your own little, your own little style. Um, so it's not, any particular one style. Sure. Yeah. So what, what change? I mean, you, you, you're talking about your father pushing you seven days a week and there aren't a whole lot of kids who, when they finally get the opportunity to choose that they're going to say, I'm going to keep doing this thing that I was forced to do, but you decided to do it just in your own way. So what was it, was it that you, you wanted to honor his request or was there enough that you had found in the time that you were taking it, that you said, you know, I do want to maintain this aspect of my life. It, it wasn't really, um, I mean, <clears throat> you, you see for the martial arts, I think it's, it's fantastic for kids. I mean, one, it teaches discipline and it teaches respect, you know, and an honor system. It's not just like, a, you know, and I'm not saying anything bad against any, anything else. Like you, you could just go jump into boxing. You could just jump into the MA. You could, but <clears throat> those are, Although they're, they're, they're great for what they are, but they're not an art, which an art teaches certain different things. There's credos to, you know, to, to, to you respecting people and, and, you know, just this, those type of things. And more common than not, it just teaches you that kind of discipline. Um, <clears throat> I do like it. Uh, and I, I, I've always liked it. I just hated being pushed at the, to the point where I, I disliked it. Uh, <clears throat> even though I still liked it. Uh, I just wanted to kind of stay away from it. And maybe, maybe I was getting rebellious at that point, <clears throat> but I came back to it only because I, I do like it. And <clears throat> I mean, what's not to like about Bruce Lee and, and, you know, one of my icons growing up and who's, who's helped us uh, Asian kids. Cause I was never the big kid. I was always the smallest kid in the class. I was always the one that picked on, <clears throat> but I was always the one kicking everyone in the head and, and I'm <laughs> alone afterwards. Yeah. So <clears throat> that was okay. And, you know, come with that. He, kind of feel good it gives you a sense of self-confidence yeah which i think a lot of kids nowadays are lacking too <clears throat> a lot of kids are are drawing from, they yeah they draw from what they have well i have an iphone 12 so i'm cool or i have the latest jeans or i have the nicest car and, and <clears throat> you take those aspects away and then what do you have then you have nothing but you build your self-confidence your self-esteem and in what you do and, and being proud then you can't ever really take that away. Right on. So that that taught me a lot. You've mentioned Bruce Lee a couple times. Yeah. Did you? W was your exposure to Bruce Lee kind of given to you by your father, or was that? Did you discover him yourself? Oh, well, it was part of my dad's life too. My, my dad had met him, uh, trained with him a couple times. Um, <clears throat> uh, they weren't buddies by any chance, but you know. He was a significant part, uh, uh, influence in my dad's life. He was, you know, obviously coming up, coming up in the '60s and '70s. You had this Asian guy coming up, <clears throat> and he made a scene, and you know where where most people would 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 just like would even bat an eye at Bruce Lee, but he 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 created waves and he created mentalities. He created chain of thoughts. He created you know <clears throat> a whole way of thinking, and also for for a whole way of, of to be looked at, viewed as being Asian coming up. Because when I was coming up in in, in Canada, I was, there wasn't a lot of Asian kids in my class, you know, mm. or you know, my round. My my parents came over to um, to Canada. Uh, you know, they were fairly young, and there there weren't really that many Asians back then either. So, kind of going up, you know, we, we, you kind of had that thing. But uh, um, Bruce Lee was was an icon for a lot of us. He he showed that you know you, you don't have to be white. Or you don't have to be black. You can be proud of being an Asian and and doing your thing, you know. <clears throat> and he 
he he taught a lot of that. And if you if you listen to a lot of his philosophies, the way he talks uh, about you know how to look for things, what not to look for things. Um, he he I, I I I felt that he brought a lot uh, for me at least in, in that aspect. And I think a lot of Asian kids um, felt that way as well. He's being so cool. He's kicking everyone's pants, and you know where he is. And he's ripped, and he's I see all those little cool what ah things, you know. So. Even white kids and black kids and all sorts of kids liked him too. And he, he's, at that point, he started becoming like an icon, not just for not just for, um, just for Asian kids, but a, a lot of different ethnicities. And that sprouted a lot of martial arts and not just any particular martial arts, but just martial arts in general. So you're, you're off, you're, you're doing your own thing. You're assembling your own style under the you know, the advice or at least in, in kind of in synergy with what Bruce Lee taught. And at some point it, it becomes more than a hobby or a pursuit or a lifestyle or whatever you would choose to call it. At some point it becomes your profession, but I'm guessing that wasn't, you know, an overnight thing. What did that track start to look like? Was it, was it a goal or did it happen accidentally? Accidentally. I had, I had no rhyme or reason, no help. I mean, I was, (laughs) I was Ontario's growing up. I was a lost kid. I didn't really had no direction. I wanted to go here. My dad wanted me to go there. I, was, I wanted to do this. And I really didn't, <clears throat> really didn't know. Um, and then one day, um, but I was just doing martial arts anyways, regardless. And there was some point where I said, okay, I want to stop competing martial arts because I want to start lifting weights because I want to start picking up girls. Because uh, I was a skinny little guy. <clears throat> and up to like grade, up to like grade 10, I was like five foot three. So you can imagine how, how terrible that is. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I just pursued martial arts heavy and I started lifting weights and I started doing things differently. Um, and um, that was, uh, that's how, how it started. And then I went to um, uh, British Columbia. I, I just literally, I sold my car and I, and I moved to BC. I didn't know anybody. I was at the airport saying, "Oh, how am I going to do now?" Um, Why? I just, I just wanted to change my life. Okay. And uh, I was, I was going, I was going to go to school, do my human kinetics and my kinesis, and I was going to get into, uh, I'll do my pre meds, working my way to check up med school, <clears throat> and then I just didn't like uh, the Western medicine uh, philosophies entirely. I know, I mean, I'm not, it's not bad. I'm just saying, it's just, there's just things I didn't like about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I went into, uh, I was going to look into physio, uh, didn't like it. Then I got into, uh, sports rehab massage therapy. But while I was doing that, <clears throat> I mean, like I was saying on another podcast one time was, you know, I was sitting in my mom, my mom's house and every Wednesday night, <clears throat> alternating every other Wednesday night was, um, rising sun and Hercules, you know? It was like, oh man, that's so cool, oh, Hercules. Oh, that could be so awesome. Oh, Rising Sun, man, Russell Wong, that was great. You know, um, <clears throat> it'd be cool to be on these shows. To, you know, <clears throat> next thing you know, um, I'm in Vancouver. I'm going to school. Um, I'm working at a nightclub called the Purple Onion, and I met this girl there one day, and and uh, we start. We went on a few dates, and she just said to me, "Hey, you know, I'm." Uh, um, I just opened up my own talent agency. Would you like to be part of it? And I was like, huh, sure, why not? I didn't really know much about it. And uh, she got me in a commercial. Hmm. And it was actually called The Karate Fighters. It's toys. <clears throat> they're like stick men. You put them on top of these little these little plastic things. And then at the end of it, you, you, you t- turn the knob back and forth. And as you turn the knob back and forth, the men, the, 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 you know, the, those action figures, they swing around their arms, go up and down, up and down, up and down. And until you, one kicks the other one in the chest where it makes the other guy pop off the stick. And if you were like, if you remember those toys or not. Yeah. Well, I was the tattoo terror. So, and it was like, this is fantastic. You know, I'm sitting in this chair and I have these beautiful makeup ladies putting makeup on me and making me the tattoo chair. <clears throat> and then, uh, and then I'm doing the thing in the sequence. And I was like, this is pretty cool. I saw myself on TV. And was, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Then I got my check. And I'm like, Whoa. I said, this is something I got to do. <laughs> and, um, it was a good check. It was a good check, <clears throat> but I really had no idea uh, how to get in the industry really. And yeah, that was kind of my toes are in it. But, and then I met these guys who were Ninja Turtles 
um, for the TV series uh, for Fox. And uh, they're working, they, they've come to club regularly. Me being an Asian guy and, and you know, kind of big, I had tattoos. <clears throat> so, you know, I'd make a good bad guy. So they said, hey, you should come and audition because um, they've seen my martial arts. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I auditioned and I got the parts and I was like, oh, this is cool. But, you know, obviously if it didn't, I, I took a year off of school so I can pursue this. And the coordinator at the time kind of screwed me over. <clears throat> and uh, I was like, huh. Like, he's like, okay, you, you eight guys, you're my guys. <clears throat> So make sure you free up your schedules because I'm going to make sure you guys are using the bad guys all the time. And I was like, oh, cool. <clears throat> it's going to be awesome. So I, I literally dropped out of school. Um, and then, you know, uh, a month goes by. I'm not really working. Another month goes by. I'm not really working. What's going on? I would go to set. and say, what, Why am I not working? Like I was supposed to be. And there's all these guys. There's all these bad guys are supposed to be on. But <clears throat> my name's not on there because... He was hiring his mechanic. He was hiring his son. He was hiring, you know, all these people <clears throat> who do him favors and stuff. So, and like, man, I, I just lost eight grand in tuition money. I took the whole year year off. I backed myself up because this, this is what you told me. And, and this is what you're doing to me. So <clears throat> I went back to school. And, uh, but I was still pursuing it. Mm -hmm. But I, I went back to school though. And I would only do the stunts part time. Because and I'm still working full time at the nightclubs. Because you know, if anything, <clears throat> I needed something to fall back on. The idea was to have a gym, right? Because um, I was also a personal trainer. Have a gym, and then I would have a uh, massage place, and I would have a martial arts studio in there. So I could I could train you, and beat you up. Then I can I can send you in the gym, make you a little bit stronger, <clears throat> beat you up some more. Then I can fix you. <laughs> you know, that was the idea. I mean, it was kind yeah. of a plan. I, I get everyone there. We get a three for one. That was great. They can work out the gym. They can train martial arts for me, and then I can fix them. <clears throat> and uh, that was on the that was on the route. Uh, so I was a massage therapist for a little bit, and then I just I uh, I'd stop that because my career as a stunt performer really started picking up. And at that point, you kind of have to make a, an executive decision <clears throat> because when stunts come up, you don't just you don't get a set schedule. They just call you and they say, "Hey, I got this part. You available these dates?" I say, "Well, yeah, but you know, if I have clients, I." you start dropping your clients and it doesn't make a very good business. So I had to say, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to do this, 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 um, I'm massage more. I'm not going to do this, uh, personal training. And I'm going to follow stunt work. And that's where I took up to. <clears throat> when, when did it, I don't, I'm looking for the right words. There was a transition point. There was a point where there was enough momentum that martial arts professionally was able to launch you. Yeah. That was in the moment tattoo tear came Okay. In. That was it. That was it. Okay. So what did, yeah. what did the next few years look like then? Well, so then I started getting stunts. And you know, the film industry, I mean, there's a lot of people in it. There's a lot of people who want to see you do well in it, but there's not a lot of people who want to see you do better than them. Mm, so all said, it, it, it's a very cutthroat industry. Won't lie. But you know, I've made some really good friends out of it. But there was at one point where I was getting beaten down so much for just people just doesn't want to see you work more than them or work too, or you're working too much or they felt that their job should have been theirs for whatever reason because they're delusional. <clears throat> um, I was actually going to quit the industry at one point because it was just that brutal. Mm -hmm. Just to, to get into the union and to be a full-time stuntman <clears throat> at your profession, you know, you have to learn a lot of things, you have to do a lot of things. That's, that's like so hard, you know, uh, just getting in the union. I know a guy that took eight years to get, you know, all his credits, just get in the union. It, it's, it's ridiculous. <clears throat> um, but this guy, um, Nick Powell, uh, he was a stunt coordinator for like The Last Samurai, uh, Braveheart, Gladiator, uh, Push, you know, Hot Rod. This guy is <clears throat> from England and he had moved to Canada and I, I met him through, other coordinators I was working with every once in a while. Um, and he, he, uh, he kind of took me under his wing <clears throat> and, uh, he's a martial artist. He's also, uh, he's a brilliant guy. He's, you know, he's he majored in, in theater and he is a geologist. He just, he's just really good in engineering, <clears throat> but he's, he's one of the best sword guys around. Um, 
and, and he, he's just <clears throat> he's just brilliant. <clears throat> so he took me under his wing, and I traveled with him uh, around the world a little while, Europe, something like that. And I was just learning, soaking up all the information from him, and he was teaching him, teaching me, and stuff like that. So that <clears throat> that was a really big transition point, and that was two thousand and uh, six, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And it was really a big transition point for me for that. Uh, and you know, <clears throat> because because of that, it, it gave me the boost to me to become immune to the treachery of people in the industry. Because ultimately, <clears throat> your work speaks for itself. You know, um, people can say what they want; they can do to you what you want. You have no control of that. But if you just can control of how you react to everything, and and you don't give them any energy, any any power by 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 all that. I mean. Then you'll do fine, uh, and as long as you can get immune. Someone once told me, "Just get immune, Brett. Immune to what people can do and say, to affect your work." And uh, that's what happened, and it's good. And martial arts was always part of my life, no matter what. Whether I was in and out of it, it was always practicing martial arts. And you know, when you start training. I started trying training new things, and I was training. I did. I did Krav Maga for like. Uh, eight or nine years, nine, nine years. <clears throat> and I was doing like other martial arts, you know, and Krabi Krabal. And I started just taking all these martial arts, which just created <clears throat> whatever style I, uh, that I needed to create, whatever I needed to, to do something for a show. Because not every show should be the same. I mean, I mean it could be depending on the character and all that jazz, but as long as you're <clears throat> creating it for the character within the show, then, you know, you can change the style, whatever you need it to be. Uh, so martial arts <clears throat> was definitely one of the biggest things that pulled me through. And although I hated my dad for the longest time because of it, <clears throat> and so many fights, they just skipped this karate class and just go to the arcade. And he caught me one time. Whoa, that wasn't fun. Uh, what did he do? <clears throat> but it definitely, what did he do? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm Chinese, I'm, I'm Chinese, Filipino, Spanish. Okay. So my dad's Chinese, my mother's Filipino. Right, she's Filipino Spanish, and and uh, <clears throat> you know anything about the Filipinos? Little bit, a little bit. I have some friends. No. <laughs> wow, slippers, smacks, belt, wall. <laughs> yeah, those are always. Real. <clears throat> but you know what? I mean, there's uh, there's something to be said for for to who uh, knew the consequences of their actions, you know, and something to be said for kids that don't. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> and that's all part of the respect value of things too. I mean, you kind of understand, you know, um, <laughs> but martial arts um, since day one, you know, <clears throat> actually, here we go. One of the big turning points in martial arts, I was in grade nine. Okay. I was five foot three. I had braces, I had glasses, I had really big hair. And um, and there was this guy, <clears throat> I don't want to mention his name. His name, his name was Dave, and so I won't tell you his last name. He uh, he was a football player, and he was a defensive linebacker. So <clears throat> at grade nine, he, I think he's probably like 5'10", maybe, 5'11". But he was, he was, I was 5'3", at 98 pounds, so... <clears throat> And I remember I was in religion class and the our teacher's name is Mr. Spaz. Um, and we're all sitting around, just waiting around. He's, try, he's trying to put up a, to show us a, a film. And this guy, he did something. And I said, why would you be such an ass for? And he said, what do you say to me? I said, why are you such an And he goes, oh yeah. And he basically threw a, a punch and I moved. And he knocked my glasses off, and I stood up and I popped him in the head. I didn't hit it, but I hit him so hard, he rolled over the desk on the other side, cut up, and I cut him in the eye. And he was like, oh, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." And at that point, the whole class got up, and went, "Rah! Oh, kid, that's awesome, Brett!" And I was like, "Holy crap!" And that was a big turning point because after that day, nobody really messed with me in school. It doesn't matter how small he was. Small, small battle, small battle, so the small triumphs that, that we have. And high school, it's a big thing, especially with the way bullying goes and, and all these things. So uh, for me, that was, that was huge. That, that, that was, uh, you know, 
that solidified a lot of like what my dad was doing, forcing me to do things. So I was like, Hey, this actually kind of works. Um, I mean, I, I don't promote violence, but it was more about the, you know, the defending of the, of the, of the week. Cause I was five foot three and like, I'm telling you 98 pounds, big, big buck teeth with braces and glasses and ugly hair. It was just, yeah. <laughs> so it was one for one, one for one for the geeks. Cause we I, I set up for us. That was good. <laughs> nice. So obviously, so we, that, you know, go ahead. Martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. That's for martial arts. That's a big turning point for me. We started our conversation acknowledging the fact that you're, you're involved in, we, we, we might have a debate about this, whether or not it's the, the biggest martial arts reboot of all time. Not that there are a lot of big things that could be rebooted, but we've got a few. And there's another pretty good size reboot that's already underway and is getting, Honestly, not a whole lot of attention, which surprises me. Which Mortal Kombat? No, no, Walker. Oh, the reboot of Walker. I didn't. I didn't know it was going to reboot it. Exactly. It's. It's. Uh, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I caught it right, it's already airing, but it's just it's limited. I'm having a hard time tracking it down with with uh, the services that I subscribe to. Yeah, what is up with that? <laughs> I don't know. It's just. Uh, Licensing agreements, I guess, is the best way to, to think of it. Terrible. Like Warrior was, I mean, <clears throat> Warrior was, it was on Cinemax, but yeah. if it had been could, anywhere else, you couldn't watch it anywhere. It was so difficult yeah. to get, even if you had HBO, it was, it was difficult to watch it. Yeah, it's, and, and let's talk about Warrior because it's, it's such a, you know, it's such a brilliant show. And, and you sent over the photos that you sent over, um, I just did a quick scan, but they, they look like they're mostly from Warrior, yes? Yeah, yeah. Warrior yeah. Season 2? One and two. Okay. And how did you get involved with that? We've, we've had a couple people from the show on. We've had... Um, Chen Tang. Chen Tang, and, and, and we had Shannon Leon. And, Shannon. Um, she's awesome. Yeah. Oh, she's, she's amazing. So how did how'd you get started in there? How would you get the call? I was on the movie Skyscraper. Um, and um, a producer, uh, my producer friend, Richard Chark, had called me and says, hey, what are you doing right now? I says, uh, I'm on Skyscraper, Dwayne Johnson. I was like, oh. He says, would you want to come on to uh, the show, inspired by Bruce Lee and Tyler blah, 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 Justin Lin, John uh, And I was like, ah, because <clears throat> it's, it's not a very big budget show, but have a read the script and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so... I read the script. I was like, oh, I mean, it could have went one of like, two ways, really. It could have went the way it did, which I thought was really good, the way it was kind of done. But I was scared because because I'm, I'm going to be doing part of the legacy of what we know as Bruce Lee's. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if I don't do it right, I mean, that's going to be hell uh, for me. I, I, I did a show and it was hell. Um, <clears throat> because I wasn't sure uh, what the cast, like it was Iron Fist <clears throat> and it was hell because I just, the lead just didn't want to do anything and uh, the show just didn't turn out very good uh, or how we expected it to at least. <clears throat> and there's a lot of criticism for that. So, you know, for me, it was just like, okay, man, I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to be part of the Bruce Lee show. I mean, I really got to do this justice. And mm. <clears throat> Jonathan Tropper really embraced a lot of what uh, creativity input I could put into and he let me shoot everything that was going to be action wise um, and, and, and put input to everything and, and be creative. So, um, <clears throat> so before that decision, it was just like, well, I'm on the show right now and it's a big, big blockbuster with Dwayne Johnson and um, huge, but this gets, gives me a chance to go to South Africa. And, yeah. uh, and <clears throat> I mean, I wasn't really having that much of a good time on Skyscraper at the time. <clears throat> for other reasons, but <clears throat> yeah, look at it like you, you only live once. And I figured if I'm going to be spending six months of my life somewhere, I want to be enjoying myself at least or having a good time because, you know, who knows what can happen any day. And, you know, exactly. you, you don't want to turn around. Go, well, that kind of sucked because I just lived the last six months of my life, like hating it. <clears throat> but uh, going to South Africa, I was able to bring uh, my team, Johnny Yang and <clears throat> Jason Ning and a bunch of guys. And, uh, and it rocked. I, mean, I loved it. <clears throat> I loved it. So I flew to Los Angeles to meet with Justin Lin and Danielle Woodrow, 
um, they were partners at the time of uh, uh, producing partners. And uh, <clears throat> they said, okay, you're our guy. Now, they asked J.J. Perry first on, on the show, which is Justin Lin, but J.J. Perry was busy uh, on Skyscraper with me, funny enough, but he was second director. <clears throat> uh, but Jason, but J.J. Perry did say some good things about me too. So um, <clears throat> they, they took a meeting with me and, the, and they, they, they took a chance on me, which, uh, which was awesome. <clears throat> I'm very thankful for. So, you know, I, uh, I had to leave Skyscraper and I was in Warrior. <clears throat> but I mean, come on, I'm with... Warrior, Bruce Lee, Shannon yeah. Lee, Justin, Gavin Tropper. I mean, and the cast. I mean, cast. I didn't really know the cast, and they weren't really big names, <clears throat> apart from maybe Joe Taslam. But I know that, like, you know, Karen Buell and some of those guys had some bigger names in, in England and stuff. But um, they were like, this is like, the cast was fantastic. The show is fantastic. The, the writers, the creatives, the. Uh, <clears throat> Jonathan Tropper. I mean, there, it was just awesome. Lonnie Pastere, I, I met, I met, I met and became a very, very good friend with Lonnie Pastere. The writers of Brad Kane and you know Josh Stoddard and Kenneth Lynn. I mean, they, they think about it, if you go look at their names now and look them around, they're like they're doing some great things. And uh, <clears throat> and they were, it was a dream team. And, uh, and I don't think, I think a lot of it too was Richard Sharkey, which is the, the producer. You, you know, a producer on board. Who, who doesn't know what they're doing can really destroy a show. Um, but he was fantastic. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I can't, I mean, in my, in my career, I think that was my highlight shows was, um, was um, Warrior season one and two. Did you, you feel any pressure? I mean, you, you talked about Bruce Lee so admiringly early on and, and, and you end up working on a show that he conceived of. Did you well, feel any weight from that? Sounds heavy. Yeah. That's the heaviest because if I would have screwed that up, can you imagine that would have been a career ender for me? Like, oh yeah, there's Brett. That's the guy who screwed up Bruce's legacy. <clears throat> Turns out it wasn't me. Turns out I, you know, me and my team, I did a good job. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's just political reasons why it went away, which we're, we're trying to fight for uh, season three still. I mean, <clears throat> before season two aired, <clears throat> we, a petition had started by the fans. It was like 8,000, 9,000 signatures. After season two aired, it's at 50,000 now. So, mm. And that's why because people were able to see it. <clears throat> now that's on HBO Max. More people are, are starting to see it, are liking it and wanting it. And so <clears throat> they're liking the martial arts in it. And, and, uh, and the story, the characters, the, it was just the writing. It was just really overall good. So let's hope. Let's hope it goes somewhere. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's an exceptional show. And but so, yeah, there's definitely the pressure. All right. Did that surface? Did the, did that impact any decisions? Is there is there a story you can say? You know, because of my legacy with Bruce Lee as a figure, I did this instead of that. Any anything like that you can share? Say that again. Well, I'm just, when I think of the decisions that I make day to day and, and people that have been influential in my life, you know, my, my parents or certain, let's say, you know, a martial arts instructor, when I'm faced with a thing, whether I'm conscious of it or not, you know, often in, in retrospect, I'll realize, ah, you know, it was because of that influence that I did this when otherwise I might've done that. And I'm wondering if, if the, the specter of Bruce Lee was was it all more than just pressure if if you said you know i think bruce lee would want this instead of that well <clears throat> i i followed i followed the lines of of where jonathan tropper wanted to take it and he was always confirming shannon lee and so we mm. talked shannon lee as well. and justin mm. Lin was the overall kind of dynamics of it all so it was <clears throat> it, following the lines of not trying to be uh bruce lee because when bruce lee had conceptualized it it wasn't supposed to be Bruce Lee he was writing at. He was supposed to play the character, but it wasn't supposed to be Bruce Lee. So <clears throat> taking the storyline to Andrew, Andrew Koji, Andrew Koji didn't want to be Bruce Lee. He just wanted to have Bruce Lee-isms. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, then John the Tropper would write in um, homages to uh, Bruce Lee movies. Every once in a while, you'd see something that was, that was specific to a Bruce Lee film. 
um, which was kind of cool. <clears throat> but um, I mean, no, I just knew that I knew that this, it, I had to do this. It, it just had to be. And, and I, I had to, to pray that they were going to, you know, kind of see the influence that, we, that me and the team would give in, in creating things <clears throat> and paying homage to, to Bruce and Jonathan Tropper being a very big Bruce Lee fan too, because he had done a lot of martial arts when he was young and Jonathan Tropper is fantastic with nunchucks <clears throat> to see him. He, he walked in one day, picked him up and he was like, holy crap. <laughs> that would be awesome, man. He goes, yeah, yeah. He's, and he sent me pictures of him with none trucks and like that. And he's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so, but the, it was always a pressure, always a pressure just to, oh, to to make sure I did it justice, and you know to make sure that you know that Shannon was happy. Um, <clears throat> Shannon called me one day and told me that you know how happy she was, when, and her mother was was really happy with the, what we've done with the action because she felt that that's how Bruce Lee would have have taken it down mm -hmm. that road. And then, um, you know, um, Bruce, one of Bruce's good friends is Daniel Santo, his daughter, Diana. And she had messaged me and she said, Hey, I just want you to know, like, you know, great job on warrior. And, you know, my dad says that this is like, so Bruce, we were so happy with this and what you've done with it. And so that alone is like, <clears throat> I mean, it doesn't get any closer to Bruce Lee at that point to the people that are close to, that closest yeah. to him that would know it. So, um, <clears throat> that was a big victory for me. Um, and I was very, I'm very proud of that moment. It's pretty exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. And my dad was, was ecstatic over that because my dad's a, a, he was a very big fan of Bruce Lee as well. I mean, the one thing my dad always did was take me to all the Bruce Lee films, no matter what. If there was a Bruce Lee film on, on TV, we'd be home watching it. Be, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> he was a big, a big thing for my father coming over in the, in the sixties, you know, being a Chinese, Amer uh, Chinese Canadian and, and you know, how they were viewed and treated back in the day. So yeah. having a, uh, someone like that is always, was pretty cool. And then how did Kung Fu happen for you? Um, <clears throat> the, well, Warner Brothers, essentially, they, they purchased uh, HBO, who then uh, took all of um, Cinemax's stuff. So they, they're having all these new shows. And, and Cinemax, uh, CW is part of Warner Brothers. It's, it's going into that. So <clears throat> the, one of the producers, who uh, Ian Smith, basically, he actually called me and he, he said, hey, do you know any female martial artists, uh, stunt coordinators? I'm like, yeah. And uh, he said, there's a show, Kung Fu Coming. It's kind of the reboot. And we wanted to have a female sun coordinator uh, because the leads are females. <clears throat> so I said, cool. So I called uh, Kim Chang. Uh, she's one of the, the top uh, martial arts uh, sun coordinators in Vancouver. And, um, <clears throat> but she was busy at the time. So I said, listen, she's busy right now. So, well, we need this budget now. So, okay, well, I can help you with the budget until she gets back. And then I done the budget and they're just like, you know what? Why don't you just do it, Brett? We kind of like you. I said, oh. <laughs> nice. And I was at the time going away somewhere, so I wasn't sure. But, you know, uh, <clears throat> COVID was hitting. I said, okay, yeah, let's, 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 let's do this. And so it happened. And that's how I got to Kung Fu. And then um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I, finished off, I finished off Snowpiercer. So it was just kind of rolling right into it. And again, we have, you know, the, the ghost of Bruce Lee lingering if, you know i assume you know your history a lot of the listeners are going to know their history because we've talked about it. it's come up on the show that you know it, it was it should have been was supposed to be could have been however you want to phrase it that he would have been the lead uh yeah it, he would have been the lead on warrior no 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 on kung fu oh on, on kung fu back in the day yeah yeah, yeah. well it's, like, I, it's the same thing really <laughs> right right pretty similar and so again we have this this thread for you you know it's you're and and maybe maybe it's it's because it's hard to say that you know as a martial artist and as um an asian martial artist growing up outside of asia you know that there it's hard to take more than a couple steps away from a man who casts such a big shadow maybe I shouldn't say shadow, but just had such an impact 
on so many that I mean, really reached globally 50 years after his passing. He's still the most recognizable figure we have in our industry. Yeah. So it's not, it's not surprising, but what can you tell us about this reboot? And well, I, I guess we'll just start there. What can you tell us? Um, <clears throat> let's see the reboot. <clears throat> it is a female lead. <clears throat> Her name is uh, Olivia Liang and she is fantastic. Uh, she's a sweetheart. Um, it, <clears throat> it encompasses a lot of, um, like Kung Fu style. Uh, and then as she comes into modern day, it kind of transitions a little bit to modern street fighting with aspects of Kung Fu at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it gels back into Kung Fu depending on who she's fighting and why. <clears throat> and that's usually because it's like, you know, uh, you come across a couple of street thugs and they're necessarily going to use a little Kung Fu, use streets styles but then you're she comes across like an ancient hero or an ancient villain and it kind of reverts back to <clears throat> what her she her shifu had taught her earlier mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's her journey about finding the the person who, who killed her her shifu and she it takes her to back to america back to her hometown okay. mm -hmm. but yeah you you won't be disappointed with this girl uh, olivia <laughs> she's, she's so good nice nice and whenever we talk about anything in the martial arts, we kind of have two demographics that we think about. We think about the people who are going to watch it with martial arts experience, and they're going to look for something in particular. And we have people who don't have martial, ex martial arts experience, and they're going to watch it with a different set of expectations and desires. I'm sure that comes up in conceiving of the movie. But does that at all impact your role? Are you, as you're coordinating these things, are you saying, you know, I want to drop this a little bit in here because, you know, uh, Kung Fu practitioners are going to, are going to, are going to pick up on what I'm putting in there, but you know, uh, we've got to make, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But you know, are, are you, are you cognizant of making the body of it something that is maybe it's less traditional? but more dynamic for the, the non-martial arts audience? <clears throat> um, that's really up to the writer. Um, the creator is Christina Kim. Um, she's awesome. And then, but she's, she's also writing for a demographics of like a younger generation of kids to <clears throat> maybe an older generation that might reminisce some parts of Kung Fu. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, they'll kind of like write the storylines and I'll, I'll, um, I'll just kind of dictate <clears throat> what's kind of happening uh, with, with, with what's happening with, with the fights uh, and, the, and the turn it takes uh, through certain things. Because, you know, like I said, like it'll, it'll, it'll turn into like she'll go through these guys, she'll help these people and, and they're fighting these, you know, tried gangsters or whatever it is. And she, she won't necessarily be all <clears throat> like Kung Fu-esque. She'll have aspects of it. Um, but then she goes into fighting this person who she's supposed to, who's also a kung fu martial artist, and and it goes back to the to, to the, the the you know the mysticism of, of the martial arts, and and that brings back and forth to the kids and then the adults. The kids will want to see hat kicking and this cool little martial arts that has happening, and then the adults who remember from kung fu back in the day are watching now will want to will want to see certain aspects of like the kung fu. It just dictates where it just it's, be, it's being dictated depending on where the show is going to or from or the, the storylines mm -hmm. happening at that point. All right. So yeah, it essentially gives everybody a little bit of taste of what they want to see. Hopefully, nice, nice, yeah. and and you know, fingers crossed that it gets the support. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be watching it. You know, um, you know, I I was sad for Badlands. I was right. sad for Warrior. You know, and, and your fingers crossed here because we need we need more. We need yeah. martial arts on TV. But you you know, you don't forget like Badlands is like an hour long and they can get risque with, with a lot of a lot of wire work, a lot of fights and all that stuff. I mean <clears throat> Warrior was an hour long too. But <clears throat> those were I mean the budget between Warrior and Badlands was like so huge in, in difference in comparison. Sure. Um he, Warrior like yeah, it wasn't wasn't a huge budget at all, but what we were able to do with it was 
was was you know great. Um, Kung Fu is a CW show, which you have to keep in mind, and it's like half an hour, so um, <clears throat> the time for lots of things isn't quite going to be quite the same as you would get from those two. Makes sense. Yeah, maybe but, maybe that's what's missing. Maybe, maybe it needed to be shorter. Maybe, maybe hopefully, <clears throat> it's all about the programming. That's right. That's right. Maybe I hope, I hope it's it done its justice. So that'd be cool. Yeah. So what's next? You know, you're you're out there for a little while longer. <laughs> but uh, what's on yeah. the docket when you when you're done? I'm on right now. I'm on Halo. Um, we're after this. Uh, there's a show I can't really talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, there's another show uh, which was going to be directed by Lonnie Pistere. <clears throat> Uh, and we're just kind of waiting. Uh, it's called The Remainders, and um, uh, it's it's kind of along the lines of something kind of like John Wick, but not really. It's kind of along those lines. Um, but I'm slated to direct three films, uh, one oh. of which I, I rewrote, um, <clears throat> and then uh, one that's to be shot in Korea, one to be shot in Thailand, and <clears throat> the one the one that I kind of rewrote, I'm trying to take that one over to. South, South Africa, in Cape Town, mm-hmm. or Vancouver. It's one of the two, really. <laughs> what can you tell us about any of those films, if anything? <clears throat> Sixteen is uh, is a show. And it's about a a guy <clears throat> who was inducted into the, the yakuza, but he's not Japanese. That's a very old story. You get those those stories a lot, but he um <clears throat> he got uh. He wanted to get out of it. <clears throat> they said, "Yeah, sure." And then they killed her and killed him and his family. Um, <clears throat> there's a rite of passage superstition that <clears throat> that fall on the lines of the certain certain superstitions of different different ethnicities. But this one basically, <clears throat> this ha- happens. It gives the 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 victim um, a right of of revenge, which, <clears throat> but it only happens for a duration of time. So his soul had inhabited a. Uh, uh, a kid's body who <clears throat> basically he wakes up in this kid's body, not really realizing it's a key's in a kid's body and the kid not really realizing there's someone happening to him until he kind of takes over the body fully. But <clears throat> he has to re- now realize that, you know, whatever he does uh, affects this boy's life after he leaves. And he, he has literally like, once he falls asleep and wakes up, he's gone. So he has to figure out how he's going to manage that and and still exact his revenge, not destroying the, the kid and still doing everything he had he came back to do. There's a whole lot, lots of twists and turns, and the boy, the boy's body the inhabited happened to be uh, a good friend of the daughter of the guy who killed him, his family, and uh, and the boy's actually in love with the girl, so it becomes a whole whole mess of things. <clears throat> but there's definitely a lot of action, a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, action, but not a lot of action like you'd think, like it's full on full on attacking mode it, it, because he's a 16 year old boy. So it can't be the same, but there are aspects of it. The other one is, um, did you ever watch the movie, the Revenger? It's familiar, but maybe not. It's on Netflix. Um, <clears throat> the lead is Bruce Kahn. Uh, this guy's a fantastic martial artist. You should see him. <clears throat> Anyways, he, uh, all the islands around Southeast Asia all have this one island they all drop their convicts on. <clears throat> so one day this guy washes on shore and he's in search of everything. So anyways, he <clears throat> he's an ex-police officer who 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 actually got himself put in prison so he can be dropped off on this island. And he wanted to hunt down the guy who killed his family. <clears throat> anyways, that storyline, uh, when he comes back, after that he comes back and it's like the world is post-apocalyptic now. And it's called Taikon. Um, so the, uh, green fish, which is Mr. Hung Lee, he, uh, has contacted me to direct, uh, that next, uh, part of it. Um, that's that one. And there's another one called Fox Hunt, which is, happens in Thailand about, um, a female assassin who her and her boyfriend decide to leave the thing and then they get a hit on them and then they find out later on it was their two of their best friends and did the deal with fighting them and then, and there's all these little tricks and trains that happen and those twists and turns uh, in the story um, that hopefully makes it exciting for everyone to watch it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. 
And <clears throat> what if, what if people want to follow along with, with what you're doing? Do you do you keep a log of this stuff on a website somewhere? I mean, you're you're you're. It sounds like you're insanely busy, and <clears throat> it doesn't stop. Well, I'm on the I'm on the wave. I, I can't jump off that wave just yet. I got to stay on the wave. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> no, I mean, I just, uh, whether it's my fi- my Facebook, my Instagram, it's usually on there. Um, aspects of something I do will be on my website, <clears throat> but I have my, my, my website's currently being updated at uh, www.breadchanstunts.com, which I want to change that. Um, <clears throat> or uh, my stunt group that I've, um, that I created a little while ago, 2007, um, called Hits International, Hits with a Z. So if you go to hitsinternational.com, You'll see uh, all the members uh, worldwide and all the different projects we're doing, what we're up to. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, ho- hopefully, if anything comes out, uh, then I usually just, I usually just post it on one of our social media outlets. So you'll see that. Well, this, is, this has been awesome. I mean, I, I didn't have to do anything. You just kind of went. And I mean, we've got a pretty, <laughs> we, which is always what I like. You know, I, I like to listen along <laughs> kind of in the same way that the audience does. Uh, but as we wrap it up here, you know, what, what would your final words to the, the folks listening be? You know, advice, wisdom, motivation, cautions, you know, anything. How do you want to send this out to the outro? Give me a topic pertaining to that I would give advice for. Well, how about this? Now let's I'm going to make you work a bit. Yeah, that's fine. Let's, let's take it as real time. <laughs> here it is. It's, it's 2021. We're recording here in February. And for a lot of people, they have not been at a conventional martial arts class in close to a year and they're, they're fading. They're losing hope. They miss training. And we have people who come to this show because it gives them a sense of being around martial artists for a little while. Yeah. Now as someone who, as you said, martial arts has always been there. You know, even when you stepped away, you were still training. What advice would you give to those folks? who are faced with a non-normal relationship to martial arts in their own training? If you really wanted it bad enough, you'll find every excuse to do it. I mean, there's this girl on Instagram, her name is Miss Megan Lee, M-I-S-S-M-E-G-A-N-L-E. Okay, <clears throat> now, if you see this girl kick, she's fantastic, okay? Or um, Aurelia Angel. Um, and they just go outside and they practice in the park. <clears throat> they wear the masks and they just practice. That's all they do because they love it. Um, if if you really want to do it, that's what you do. I mean, I'm I am fortunate enough because we're I'm in a in a stunt situation where <clears throat> we have to is what we have to do because we're we're creating we're doing things so we're constantly training and doing stuff so that's that's what we're able to do and <clears throat> and blessed that way. Um, but like you look at Megan Lee or, or what they're doing. I mean, you can always find like one person at least who, who has the same interest and you guys can do drills together. Uh, just be safe, uh, be uh, conscious about it. And you can always go train. There was this girl. So <clears throat> one of our leads on Kung Fu is, is, uh, you know, she's, she's, uh, <clears throat> she has, she has no martial arts, but she's a lead. She's supposed to be a master. So what, what did she do? I have a double for her. It, Kung Fu is a very particular skill, right? So um, so I told this one girl, her name's Aliyah Iskakova. Um, I said, Aliyah, it's COVID now. We're going to come back in September. Go train Kung Fu. So what she did was, I think it was like three days a week, she was on a Zoom call for two hours a night uh, training Kung Fu. Uh, and she came back in September and she went for an audition and she killed it. She was so awesome. And she did all this training in her basement on a computer screen with somebody talking her through it. And she's so good now. Like she had to learn Eagle Claw and, and Crane and her stances, her movements, her, I mean, it was just like, and she learned it all from just being, being the girl on, 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 on a, on a Zoom call. So, I mean, if you really want it bad enough, you, you'll find, every excuse to to do it i love when we get someone on the show who has been able to take their passion for martial arts and show us where their life changed because of it 
and then they continue training and turn it into their job. It happens quite a bit with our guests. And yet every story, while there are plenty of similarities, there are some important differences. And on this episode, when I started hearing Mr. Chan talk about how his father made him train, I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, obviously we knew he kept training at some point, but I was expecting there was going to be a, a big gap in there or, or some other stuff. So I'm really thankful that that didn't happen because look at what's come out of it. Not just for him, but selfishly for all of us. Some absolutely wonderful content. And this is yet another reminder. If you haven't checked out Warrior, do so and get on that petition that I believe he mentioned during the episode. There's a petition going around to, to keep the show going. You should check out. And if you're anything like me, you're looking forward to some of these other projects that he mentioned. I mean, the, the reboot of Kung Fu, I'm so excited. So, Mr. Chan, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for your time, your stories. Had an absolute blast. Those of you listening, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the episode. Check out the show notes with the links and the photos and all that good stuff. And then head on over to whistlekick.com and check out what we've got going on over there. Maybe find something you want to you want to throw in your shopping cart. Bring in bring into your home. We got that code podcast15 if you forgot. And remember sharing episodes and leaving reviews and telling friends, those are all up additional important ways to help grow what we do as we grow we reach more and more listeners and also more and more guests if you've got a suggestion for a guest or a topic go ahead reach out jeremy at whistlekick.com or fill out one of the forms at one of the websites there are lots of ways to reach us if you see somebody out there wearing something that says whistlekick on it make sure you say hello and introduce yourself and our social media is at whistlekick that's all we have for you today until next time train hard smile and have a great day.